Hello, everyone. My name is Aaron So. My classmate Matt Adelman and Aaron Elmore and I will be speaking to you guys about shoulder pain in patients with spinal cord injury. Here are our learning objectives, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will understand the prevalence of shoulder pain in patients with spinal cord injury, understand the anatomy of the shoulder and common diagnosis for shoulder pain in patients with SEI, describe the risk factors for shoulder pain development in patients with SEI, describe the predictor of shoulder pain development in patients with SEI, examine common outcome measures used to assess shoulder pain in patients with SEI, appraise interventions for treating shoulder pain, and analyze different hand patterns in wheelchair propulsion and how each pattern changes the muscular demands involved. Now, given the current U.S. population size of 329 million people, a recent estimate showed that an annual incidence of spinal cord injury is approximately 54 cases per 1 million people in the United States, or about 17,000 new cases each year. Shoulder joint pain is one of the most frequent secondary complaints of people following spinal cord injury, with the prevalence reported to range from 36% to 71%. Studies have shown that by 20 years post-injury, over 70% of individuals with paraplegia develop shoulder pain. So now we move on to the pathophysiologic causes of shoulder pain in patients with spinal cord injuries. The most common area of injury is the subacromial space, which is located above the humeral head and below the acromion. Two tendons run underneath that space, which are the supraspinatus tendon as a part of the rotator cuff, and the biceps long head tendon. Those two tendons are also accompanied by the subacromial bursa. If this space gets smaller as a result of superior translation of the humeral head, many potential diagnoses may occur. The most common is subacromial impingement, which can lead to a whole host of problems such as subacromial bursitis, rotator cuff tendinopathy via the supraspinatus tendon, and or bicipital tendinopathy. These can progress further into a rotator cuff or biceps long head tear and or an acromioclavicular joint arthropathy, which is the inflammation of the AC joint itself. Shoulder pain in patients with SCI reduces their independence and quality of life. To prevent this disability, several authors focus their studies on identifying the most important risk factors. For non-modifiable risk factors, literature showed that shoulder pain manifestation is highly correlated with age, specifically over 50 years old. Females had almost two times higher odds of having shoulder pain as compared to males. High thoracic SCI patients have more chances of presenting shoulder pain. Now, studies have said that this may be explained by the adaptation of trunk control during wheelchair propulsion, causing muscle strength imbalances between the shoulder adductors and abductors. Modifiable risk factors for shoulder pain in SCI patients include manual wheelchair use, poor seat posture, improper wheelchair setup, and a BMI of over 25. A study found no correlation between shoulder pain and BMI if BMI was evaluated alone but BMI becomes a significant risk factor if the subject does more than 12 transfers per day. So now we move on to predictors of developing shoulder pain. This study by Walper et al. in 2019 found a number of factors that were associated with increased shoulder pain in patients with paraplegia who were using manual wheelchairs. One of these contributing factors is weak shoulder adductor muscles, aka the pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi. Uh, another one is positive shoulder joint work during recovery periods, or in other words, Actively using the shoulder joint during periods of supposed recovery was another association with shoulder pain development. And finally, uh, lower flexibility and mobility with trunk flexion were associated with developing shoulder pain as well. If the patient presents with any of these associations, they are more likely to develop shoulder pain over time. Other predictors were found by Hogaboom et al. in 2016, who investigated the prognostic values of transfer techniques, age, and weight for developing shoulder pain in patients with paraplegia. They found that worse transfer techniques, as measured by the transfer assessment instrument, was associated with shoulder pain development. Uh, basically, the lower the score on the TAI, uh, the worse the transfer technique, and thus the greater association for developing shoulder pain. Uh, they also found that greater age and uh, higher weight attributed to the development of shoulder pathology, including subacromial impingement syndrome. So here we can take a look at some of the commonly used outcome measures used to assess shoulder function in individuals with SCI. The DASH is a good activity and participation level outcome measure that we should already be somewhat familiar with. The physical activity scale for individuals with physical disabilities is another activity and participation level outcome measure that is probably new to most of us. However, by now we've all taken our turns attempting bed mobility, executing transfers, and navigating the environment in a wheelchair acting as patients with SCIs. So we should all be able to empathize with the amounts of shoulder strength, stability, and range of motion required for independent mobility. A lack in any of these requirements may not only decrease proper function, but it often results in pain, especially with the repetition of poor quality movements. And that's why I want to spend more time talking about the wheelchair user's shoulder pain index. As the name implies, the wheelchair user's shoulder pain index focuses on pain as the BSF level outcome measure. 
It takes a relatively short amount of time to administer at about 5 to 10 minutes, and it covers 15 items comprising of four areas, transfers, wheelchair mobility, self-care, and general activities. The measure has excellent test-retest reliability with an intra-class correlation of 0.99. The MDC calls for a change of at least 5.1 points to indicate a true change of pain. The index is comprised of 15 items that correlate to an activity that a wheelchair user will need to perform at one time or another. Each of the items are then ranked within a range of 0 to 10 according to the visual analog scale. A score of 0 would equate to no pain, while a score of 10 represents the worst pain possible. The scores for each item are then added up. Having 15 total items, the maximum possible score would be 150. The higher the score, the more severe the pain. But while this outcome measure may be useful in documenting changes in overall shoulder pain, as physical therapists, we want to be more familiar with what areas of movement are being evaluated in this outcome measure so we can identify movements that are the most troublesome for our patients so we can adjust our plan of care accordingly. The first area consists of transfers which has four items. The patient will rate his or her shoulder pain while transferring from a bed to a wheelchair, from the car to a wheelchair, from the tub or shower to a wheelchair, and while loading a wheelchair into a car. The next area has two items that encompass wheelchair mobility. The patient will first describe their shoulder pain after using a wheelchair for greater than 10 minute bouts, and then while navigating up or down ramps. The third area focuses on self-care. The five items in this area are lifting objects overhead, putting on pants, putting on a shirt, putting on a button-down shirt, and washing his or her back. The fourth and final area covers general activities, such as shoulder pain during school or work activities, while driving, while doing household chores, and or while sleeping. Identifying the troublesome task or tasks within each area may help you determine the impairments of the shoulder that underlie the pain, whether it be a strength or endurance deficit, instability, and or insufficient range of motion. This information can then help you inform your intervention strategy and direct your plan of care, while also providing a reliable outcome measure that can be used to document overall improvement. So before we discuss specific interventions for shoulder pain in patients with SCI, I want to go over a summary of best practice by the CPG from the Journal of Spinal Cord Medicine. In terms of preserving upper limb function following a spinal cord injury, the following steps are recommended. As PTs, we should aim to educate healthcare providers and persons with SCI about the risk of upper limb pain and injury, the means of prevention, treatment options, and the need to maintain fitness. We should also aim to minimize the frequency of repetitive upper limb tasks, such as reach of the arm overhead repeatedly. Further, we should aim to provide manual wheelchair users, users with SEI a fully customizable manual wheelchair made of the lightest material possible and adjust the rear axle as far forward as possible while maintaining stability. Finally, we should aim to incorporate flexibility exercises and resistance training into an overall fitness program. So for our first intervention study, we have the STOMPS RCT from Mulroy et al. in 2011. The objective of the Strengthening and Optimal Movements for Painful Shoulders, or STOMPS, trial was to determine the effects of an exercise program and instruction to optimize performance of upper extremity tasks on shoulder pain in, pa in people with paraplegia. The subjects of the study needed to be older than 14 years old, uh, had sustained an SCI of five years duration, have unilateral or bilateral shoulder pain that interfered, interfered with a functional task like wheelchair transfers or propulsion, and utilized a manual wheelchair for mobility over 50% of the time in order to qualify for this study. In total, 80 subjects with paraplegia participated in the study and were split into two groups of 40. Uh, one of the main limitations of the study was that the dropout level was very high, as 14 subjects in the experimental group dropped out, while 8 subjects in the controlled group dropped out. Uh, in terms of the outcome measures, uh, the WUSPI was the primary outcome measure, which was described earlier by Aaron Elmore. The visual analog scale was used to measure pain levels, and a handheld dynamometer was used to measure muscle strength. In terms of interventions used, the exercise group received a 12-week shoulder home exercise program that was supervised by a physical therapist. This program came with three phases. The stretching phase consisted of anterior and posterior capsule stretches, as shown by images A and B on the left, and upper trapezius stretches, as shown by image C. The warm-up phase and resistive phase consisted of the following exercises. Shoulder adduction, shoulder external rotation, scapular elevation in scaption, and scapular retraction. The warm-up phase was uh, performed with, the, with those exercises, but without any resistance. With the resistive phase, the shoulder adduction and external rotation exercise intensities were set at the 8 rep max, with the goal of muscle, of muscle hypertrophy, while the scapular elevation and retraction exercise intensities were set at the 15 rep max for the goal of muscular endurance. This program was followed three times per week for 12 weeks. The control group, on the other hand, received treatment of a one-hour instructional video with educational handouts and brochures. 
Uh, this control group treatment was basically designed as a sham treatment. So now we move on to the results of the SNOPS trial. And after following this intervention program, shoulder pain was found to have decreased to one third of baseline levels in the exercise optimization group. Shoulder torques and quality of life scores were improved as well. Uh, these results led to the conclusion that the home exercise program was effective in reducing long-standing shoulder pain in patients with paraplegia and led to associated improvements in muscle strength and overall quality of life. As an added bonus, the STOMPS trial further reinforced the recommendation of the CPG to incorporate a stretching and resistance training program for reducing shoulder pain in patients with SCI. The study we found investigated the effect of EMG biofeedback training in addition to a standard exercise program to reduce shoulder pain in manual wheelchair users with SCI. Inclusion criteria were that they were 18 years or older and living in the community, had a spinal cord injury with C6 or lower for two or more years in duration, used a manual wheelchair 30 hours per week or more, and had a musculoskeletal pain in the shoulder girdle region that rated about 3 to 8 out of 10 on the NPRS scale, and they were experienced during or increased by performance of daily activities. Participants of the study were 15 volunteers who had received medical care at the Medical University of South Carolina or the Charleston Veteran Administration Medical Center. After baseline testing, participants were randomly assigned to one of two intervention groups, seven to group A, which is the exercise group, and eight to group B, which is the exercise plus EMG biofeedback group. Primary outcome for both groups was assessed by re-administration of the wheelchair user pain index at 10 weeks after the start of the exercise program. Group A attended two 90-minute sessions scheduled two weeks apart for one-on-one -on -one instructions on an exercise program to be carried out at home in a wheelchair using an instruction manual and elastic exercise bands. The exercise program was to be performed once a day, minimum of five days a week for eight weeks. The exercise routine involved five exercises that focus on gentle stretching of the upper traps, biceps, and pectoral muscles, and four exercises that focus on strengthening the posterior scapular muscles and shoulder rotators, adductors, and extensors. Now these begin with one set of five repetition using moderate resistance to minimize muscle soreness and progress by increasing the number of sets and elastic band resistance. Group B received home exercise instructions and education identical to group A. However, it was followed by three to four additional sessions over six weeks for EMG biofeedback training, which was carried out by a physical therapist. EMG biofeedback training targeted four key muscles, the upper traps, lower trapezius, anterior deltoids, and infraspinatus on both right and left sides. EMG biofeedback was also used to improve posture during wheelchair propulsion. The results of the study offer support that muscle training with EMG biofeedback added to a standard exercise program adds value to reducing shoulder pain in patients with SCI. A substantial benefit from EMG biofeedback was found at 10 weeks when participants who received EMG biofeedback plus exercise had a significant reduction in shoulder pain, whereas participants who received only the exercise did not. The reduction in the shoulder pain with EMG biofeedback training was reported to be twice that of the exercise alone. And at a six-month follow-up, Group B, which is the one that received the EMG biofeedback plus exercise, achieved a 82.3% reduction in shoulder pain and a wheelchair user shoulder pain index score numerically lower than that of Group A. A limitation of the study was that the sample size is very small. The authors suggest that future research should be conducted with more participants. In conclusion, the finding from the study indicated that EMG biofeedback may be valuable in preventing and treating shoulder pain when combined with a valid exercise program for patients with spinal cord injury. Preventing shoulder pain and disability is extremely important in individuals with SCI because they rely so heavily on shoulder function for mobility. Likewise, finding the most efficient wheelchair propulsion pattern can spare one's shoulder quite a bit of grief in the long run. Any propulsion hand pattern can be broken down into two phases. The first is known as the contact phase, defined by when the hand is in contact with the push rim, delivering mechanical energy to the wheelchair. In this phase, the user performs a pushing movement, recruiting muscles like the pec major and anterior deltoids. The second is the recovery phase, when the hands disengage the push rim and swing back to initiate the next cycle. This phase requires a pulling movement, calling to action most of the posterior upper extremity musculature. The similarity between all hand patterns is that they each have a contact phase and a recovery phase. We can further subdivide these phases into general physiologic movements. In the contact phase, we need shoulder flexion, adduction, internal rotation, and scapular protraction. We see just the opposite in the recovery phase, shoulder extension, abduction, external rotation, and scapular retraction. This is helpful to know for how strengthening certain muscle groups may affect specific propulsion phases. But what differentiates propulsion patterns besides the obvious observation? Well, proper propulsion isn't all about strength. Two other important components are cadence and push angle. 
The cadence refers to the frequency of the push cycle. The push angle might be better understood as an illustration. Looking at this diagram, it basically refers to the arc length on the push room between the initial contact point and the release point of the hand. Now, efficient propulsion typically has a slower cadence and is most often a result of increasing the time spent in the recovery phase. By increasing the recovery phase, it benefits the user by allowing more time for the pushing muscles to recover, staving off fatigue and possible muscle strains. However, for a given speed, the same amount of power must be applied to the hand rim to overcome external loads during each stroke. A decrease in cadence reduces the percent of the cycle that's spent in the contact phase, which in turn increases the push phase power requirements to maintain a constant average stroke power. But another way to offset the force requirement is by pairing a decreased cadence with a larger push angle. A larger push angle can be achieved through greater extension of the shoulders and elbows to reach further back on the push rim at the beginning of the contact phase. It can also be achieved through greater flexion of the shoulder and trunk to reach further forward on the push rim at the end of the contact phase. One reason this can be beneficial is because it decreases the amount of force needed to maintain a constant power output while naturally slowing down the cadence as it takes longer for the hands to travel along the length of the contact arc. In addition, a longer push angle means that less pushes are needed to travel the same distance as one would with a smaller push angle. Another benefit is that it can actually decrease the impact on the upper extremity during the contact phase. For example, if the user contacts the push rim at more of a perpendicular angle, they are subject to rapid loading of the upper extremities, increasing their risk of developing wrist pain or shoulder impingement. By reaching further back on the push rim, the upper extremity can gradually accept the load of the chair, creating less of an impact. However, maximal changes in push angle may not always be optimal because it does depend on the user's range of motion and functional strength within that range of motion. So instead of trying to immediately maximize a patient's push angle, it may be better to increase the push angle incrementally. So here are four common propulsion patterns that we've already seen in class and probably even practiced during lab week. But looking at the diagram, you can start to visualize the contact points, the push angles, and the phases. The arc pattern, as we've learned, is most used by novice wheelchair users, but is the least efficient in terms of energy consumption, as it has the smallest push angle and the shortest recovery time. As users become more advanced, they may find that adopting one of the other patterns saves them effort. Because the semicircular pattern has a slower cadence due to its longer recovery phase, current clinical guidelines recommend its use for wheelchair propulsion. However, such recommendations can't be confidently made without an understanding of the influence of hand pattern on upper extremity muscle demand, such as muscle power and muscle stress. The problem is that these quantities are very difficult and impractical to measure experimentally. In this study, subjects were analyzed using 3D hand rim kinetic monitors and a motion analysis system as they completed different wheelchair patterns within a stationary ergometer. The purpose of the study was to use musculoskeletal modeling and forward dynamic simulations to investigate the influence of hand patterns used on specific measures of upper extremity muscle demand. The study used 223 total subjects, each with complete motor paraplegia. The study found that the arc pattern experienced the highest levels of overall upper extremity demand across the full propulsion cycle. And again, this is likely due to having a smaller push angle and shorter recovery phase. But interestingly, the arc pattern also showed the lowest subscapular stress through the push cycle. This could be important if one was interested in reducing their risk of injury or fatigue to the subscapularis. The single loop pattern experienced the second highest level of overall demand across the full cycle, but it also produced the second highest average power through the full cycle. Despite having the first highest stress in the contact phase, it only had the second highest overall stress because the contact phase was such a small percentage of the full cycle. However, another thing to think about is that this pattern resulted in relatively high stress in the infraspinatus and subscapularis muscles, which could increase the risk of fatigue and injury. The double loop pattern required a bit more shoulder range of motion to perform and an increased demand on the anterior deltoid. However, it also showed the lowest level of overall upper extremity demand, the longest recovery time, and the greatest movement per cycle, which is likely the result of having such a large push angle. Finally, the semicircular pattern which also required a bit more shoulder range of motion, showed the second lowest overall upper extremity demand and the lowest stress in the contact phase. But one thing that really stood out about this pattern is that the overall demand of the full cycle was very evenly distributed between the contact phase and the recovery phase. This allowed for less impact at the joints when transitioning between the phases and more fluid movements. So the takeaway from the study was that when it comes to muscle power and muscle stress, the most favorable patterns seem to be the double loop and the semicircular. However, the limitations to the study included that the data was collected on a wheelchair ergometer in a lab setting, which doesn't quite replicate overground propulsion. 
Also, in the simulation that was used, forces that were generated at the hand and the wrist were not included in the calculations, so a lot of this is really just recommendations based on muscle power and stress in the shoulder. Also, only self-selected speeds were used in this study and not max velocity, which oftentimes in manual wheelchair users, they modify their hand position based on the demand and the speed of their chair. So in a few bullet points to summarize this presentation, by 20 years post-injury, over 70% of individuals with paraplegia will develop shoulder pain. Shoulder pain manifestation is highly correlated with age. Females have two times higher odds of having shoulder pain as compared to males. An overall fitness program for shoulder pain should include minimizing repetitive shoulder use and incorporating stretching and resistance training. EMG biofeedback with a valid exercise program can be a great method to use in preventing and treating shoulder pain in patients with SCI. And finally, the double loop and semicircular wheelchair patterns seem to be the most efficient propulsion patterns. However, these patterns are more advanced and require the user to have an adequate range of motion in their shoulder to maintain a larger push angle. And here's a list of our references. I hope this presentation was helpful to you guys, and thanks for watching.